something. And then we will also have one installment of um, the essence of Vajrayana, uh, Chakra Samvara commentary uh, for those who have the initiation. So that will be next Saturday. Um, then uh, Losar, which I believe is the 10th of February this year, Geshe-la will give a transmission yet to be determined. The team is deciding, as well as the Bodhisattva vows, just in a short session in the morning, just so that um, to give him some space to go and meet some Tibetan friends if he wants to. Um, so that will be uh, the early morning, probably around 8 a.m. on the uh, Losar day. Um, there was one more thing. Ah, yes. And so um, uh, I will be uh, away for about a week. So there will be um, kind of one weekend where Geshe and I are not here at all. So on the Losar weekend on the Saturday, there's going to be Geshe transmission. Um, that will be, and the Bodhisattva vows, that will be the last thing for about uh, a week. And then on that Sunday, um, Michael Yum, who is a student of um, Yang Siren Pache and Maitripa College, he's actually now doing a postdoc at the University of Toronto. Um, his research, which he did with Jose Cabezon, who's kind of a big deal in the Tibetology world, it is uh, about Ganden Monastery and Lama Tsongkhapa. So we've invited him to give a talk about uh, Lama Tsongkhapa. So um, I hope people uh, are, uh, you know, maybe interested um, in that. Then the following week, I'm not sure if we'll have something. It may be empty. But then after that, we will continue with a series um, of, of Sundays. Um, the Sundays, I think we have two more of Lama Tsongkhapa's texts, and then we'll be doing purification looking at the Sutra of the Three Heaps, or the 35 Buddhas practice, and the Chishak, the confession um, prayer. Uh, and I think, yes, I think that covers everything. So um, I won't take any more of your time. We'll invite Geshe down and get started. Great to see everybody. So can everyone hear me clearly? Okay, great. We'll do a test with Geshe-la. So Tashi Dele, greetings to all. Hello, can you hear geshe -la okay? Okay. I might great. say it's a little quiet. Is it a little quiet? Uh, yeah. Um, huh. Did the game okay. turn up a bit? Can you turn up the game? I can do, but that, that would be really high and I don't know any last time that it hurt my ears. But yeah, I mean, okay, if that happens, you can turn it down again. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can hear. It's just a little soft. Input value. Put that 80 bill slide up by these long. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yes, no, do let me know if things get too loud or too soft. Okay. We're, we're happy to adjust for folks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Okay. So first of all, Tashi Dele greetings to all. Geshele hopes that everything is going well for everybody this year. He hopes that you're developing more feeling for your study and practice, and he also hopes that your study and practice are improving this year. So also remember to have the basis of this human rebirth, which is like a precious wish-fulfilling jewel. This gives us all these extraordinary capacities. We should have the feeling that we can do it in terms of practice. So, of course, we are within cyclic existence, we are within samsara, and within samsara, then we are striving to that contaminated samsaric happiness. But that we should look on as an extra. It's kind of like an extra thing that they do. The main thing that we want, Gonda, uh, but we have to understand that this samsaric happiness is something temporary, impermanent. Because we want to cross this ocean of samsara to the other shore, we need a bridge which is going to help to get us there. We can look at that samsaric happiness as being a little bit like that bridge. However, if we spend all of our time focusing on this bridge of samsaric happiness, because that samsaric happiness is so dependent upon causes and conditions, and because these are unreliable, there's always going to be a flux. And if we just pay attention to that, we'll waste a lot of our time. And so how do we come to a prophet? We think that whether we think of ourselves, whether we think of others, there is a no one who does not wish for happiness. So if we are able to use this human form in order to achieve something of benefit for ourselves, something of benefit for others, then we have achieved something worthwhile. So when we talk about this self and then connected with that self, that that we call my mind, we understand that this self and this mind can reach an end point that is really extraordinary. And that is what many of the teachings are indicating. So, another really interesting thing that Geshe wanted to mention here, that that we call the self is a continuum with no end. That that we call my mind, parceled with that, is a continuum with no end. But samsaric suffering is something which has an end, which can be extinguished. So because of that then, from the very bottom of our mind, the bottom of our heart, we have this 
sort of natural inclination to work towards achieving a state free from problems, to be able to work towards the state of final and lasting happiness. But if you think of that, maybe it seems so far off, right? that that uh, kind of final happiness that we are thinking, this is something that is so far off and so way in the future. But actually, the secret is, as we work towards that, we can go from temporary happiness to temporary happiness all the way until that final happiness. <clears throat> so we need to use this human brain, we need to use this human mind by keeping the mindset in kind of a very vast fashion. And so to do that, to begin this task, let us take a moment to settle our body and mind into a peaceful state. Think the mind is neutral, a naturally equanimous state. Rest in that. Think that those unhelpful feelings and thoughts, they are like clouds in the sky which slowly evaporate through the heat of the sun. Think through relaxing my mind in this way. It's like stilling the water of the ocean or something. When the water is perfectly still and clear, we can perceive any object on the bottom. Similarly, by stilling our mind in this way, we will be able to clearly comprehend any object. So, we can first just relax in this vastness. The analogy is like a child walking into a beautifully ornate temple. He or she just takes the whole experience in without focusing on any object in particular. And think that as we observe changes within the mind, nothing is steady, everything is in flux. So samsara too is constantly in a state of change.
and as we look at that unsteady state of samsara, it's always being in flux. Think about actually how any object that we bring to mind, it has the appearance that there's some pinpointable steady thing there, but in fact there is nothing that can be pointed to at all. Think the nature of this mind is pure luminosity, and if I can touch into that, it has the capacity to be able to perceive the final mode of abiding of any phenomena, in other words, to see how it really is. For the benefit of myself, for the benefit of others, I can tap in to this luminous clarity and be able to understand the mode of abiding of any object and bring great benefit to myself as well as to others. And to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, with single-pointed concentration, I will make requests to be able to actualize that. So the Kogan do I said to Geshe-la, is when we do the meditation, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe you guys, do you feel like Geshe-la's voice is like super soft and gentle when we do the meditation? Yeah, he's like, you can hear it, Kedrup. I'm like, yeah, but we, we do occasionally get, especially on Facebook, Tibetan people listening. So. <laughs> yeah, so he agrees, he agrees. Okay, let us begin with the praise to the Buddha. Jumbo, <laughs> 
So our final goal through which we can achieve real happiness, this is to achieve both for ourselves and help others to achieve the supreme state of liberation. And because it is not easy to reach, to reach that ultimate liberation, which is full Buddhahood, we need a path that is both complete and a path that is unmistaken and vast. And we can see the results if one is able to ascend this complete and unmistaken path to its end, we see that the great beings who have achieved this, whether we speak about Buddha Shakyamuni, whether we speak about Maitreya, whether we speak about Tara, and so forth. And it's really important to look to those examples for inspiration, but also they help us see that in terms of achieving the state of final enlightenment, gender is not a restriction. Whether one is male, whether one is female, one can reach the supreme state of Buddhahood without exception. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but Lama Tsongkhapa states very clearly in his treatise on Tantra that through the practices of the Vajrayana, whether male or female, one can in one lifetime, in that very body, achieve the state of Supreme Buddhahood. So Geshe said, he, he, he shares this with you, 
Because when we look at the exclusively sutra approach, some of the scriptures do seem to indicate that for women it is more difficult. But he wants to remind you that from the practice of tantra, there is absolutely no differentiation. Uh, and another thing that Geshe wants to tell you in the light of this, all right, so the people, when we look at the, at the scriptures, it's also very important to understand this, that, for example, Lama Tsongkhapa, he was an author of scriptures from quite early on in his life, but it's generally kind of ex, uh, accepted amongst religious scholars that from sort of when we look at the continuum from the beginning to the end, the texts that Lama Tsongkhapa composed towards the end of his life, these are kind of more sophisticated and reliable than the texts towards the beginning, even though those are still very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why is that the case? Because, of course, Lama Tsongkhapa, after he realized the view, the really kind of final comprehension of the view, that realization informed the scriptures that he composed during the later part of his life. And so, because of that, Geshe Le just reminding us as we recite this refuge and bodhicitta verse, we want to uh, travel this unmistaken and complete path to enlightenment. For example, as is explained in this text here, in order to be able to do that, we need the practice which allows us to abandon a mistaken in favor of unmistaken path, and we need the practice which is refuge. I'm sorry, specifically the uncommon Mahayana refuge. And we need the practice <laughs> that allows us to abandon a narrow in favor of a vast path, which is the mind generation or bodhicitta. And another thing that Geshe wants to remind you of, and he says, you know, reminding you also because this is something we're supposed to think about again and again. When we think about the object of refuge, we know that there are three objects of refuge. We know that the teacher is the Buddha. The Sangha are like the friends, the companions along the path. But it is the Dharma, the teachings themselves, which are the actual refuge. <laughs> And that means, right, that within this abode of samsara, of cyclic existence, to achieve that liberation, we need to take the medicine ourselves, that medicine of the Dharma. And when we contemplate this, we also contemplate a sense of responsibility that whether one goes into a happy direction, whether one goes into the direction of more difficulty, this is something that is very much in our own hands. Whether we think of Kedrup Nozong Gyatso, Gyawa Ensapa, Lord Milarepa, they were just like us with the same human body in one body, one lifetime. They were able, able to reach the state of complete enlightenment. Yeah. And our body, our mind have every bit of the same capacity that theirs did. If we look at Lord Milarepa in particular, you know, you see those very emaciated looking images of Lord Milarepa. Our physical health is probably a lot better than his was. So we have all the facilities we need. So we need to think about these examples and really kind of bolster our resolve that if I do well in the practice, I can definitely 
um, ascend along the path. Things will go well. Nanzo Lorzo Nolechi is a girl, Lor Nolechaba, Lor Gotanjoni, Zalavare, Sochi. Del Jor. So then um, it is said that Lam Rim is kind of the essence of the path, these stages of the path to enlightenment. It is said that the door to the Lam Rim is conviction about the precious human rebirth with the freedoms and richnesses. And it is said that the door to meditation is a proper motivation. The door to meditation is a proper motivation. And it is said that the door to actualization, to the implementation of the Dharma in life, are the teachings on karma, cause and effect. So if we think about those three points, actually, it's quite beautiful, right? And easy for us to kind of keep in our mind and contemplate. So then, having keeping all of that in mind, let us just take a moment to bring forth that positive motivation. So taking um, the breath as your object of focus, just use that to ground or calm the mind. Just like a fish that flits across the surface of the ocean without disturbing it or creating waves, just think that whatever arises in the mind, we don't need to follow it as a distraction. We can just watch. So just develop that stable awareness of the rising and falling of the breath. Because the mind's bare nature is one of equanimity or neutrality, when we touch that through awareness, the body and mind can become peaceful. And then think as we rest in that stillness, we touch the mind's ultimate aspect of pure luminosity. And in this way, become open and peaceful. And expand beyond that, that awareness and think self, others, human beings, animals, any being within samsara possesses within itself the potential for liberation, the potential for bodhicitta, the tata gata garma, the Buddha nature. Nika, Nika, Kurukane, Tetis, Yumi, Ramadota, Sanchi, Yo, Mepa, Kangalolo, 
So so good new year's at Chambo. What are the new you doing somebody? With an appreciation for the potential of all of those beings, think that because of some temporary circumstance, it may appear that I have difficulties with one sentient being or another. But from a higher perspective, they are all immeasurably close to me. Yo, Mabel, send the near Tachimokari in a ten noji, so so the carriage him with the near Tachimoju. Without exception, with that awareness, because all of these beings are so close to me, there's no way that I can say that they have not shown me great kindness. Yes, or Sola Supata Mombo, she call you Gangan of Dede or Soso Gata, the Mavazu Yagata, they say you are Shutari, the Lakatimbochi. And many of those sentient beings, they are enduring suffering and difficulty, such as in the three unfortunate realms of samsara. Right now, with this body and mind, I am in the best position to be able to working to doing something about. But to be able to help those beings in the very best possible way, merely achieving liberation for myself is not enough. Similarly, even bringing forth bodhicitta is not enough. I must work towards the final goal of complete Buddhahood to most effectively benefit them. So as much as you can, try to bring forth that bodhicitta in your mind. Can I achieve the state of Buddhahood to help them? I definitely will be able to, because we need to understand that whether we think about the afflictive minds, whether we think about the afflictive or the knowledge obscurations, whether we think about this root of selfishness, the self-cherishing attitude, none of these things has any valid basis in reason whatsoever. So we'll pause there. Can you, so, sorry, uh, can you guys hear the gong or no? You can. Okay, good. <laughs> Progress on that front. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm drinking water out of this huge thing. I, I'm trying to be more environmentally friendly. I might not be able to have the teal colored cargo vest and be a cool environmentalist, but at least I can have this. <laughs> <laughs> So Geshe said that in terms of these paths to arising bodhicitta, to achieving Buddhahood, all of the kind of rocks on those paths or the uh, obstructions, the blocks, they are adventitious, right? The afflictions are adventitious. They are like guests that are temporarily in our home. So 
Geshe-la said whether the guests remain or not, it's really up to us, right? We can tell them to leave. <laughs> but, you know, some guests are a little bit entitled, and if you don't sort of ease them in getting out of your house, they're just going to stay there for a really long time. <laughs> so it's really your responsibility to say kind of now is the time to leave. So in order to be able to reach Buddhahood, we talked about an unmistaken path, an unmistaken method. There is nothing supreme uh, to uh, the method outlined in this text, and specifically the three minds of definite emergence or renunciation, uh, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness. And so Geshe-la says that he says supreme in terms of right the view and how we get there that's being described. But it's also important to understand that, for example, what Lama Tsongkhapa explains in the three principal aspects of the path, this is no different than what is explained in the great Sakya text parting from the four attachments, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So it may appear, right, that the view is kind of being explained differently, kind of with different words, but in terms of the purpose and where we're trying to go, it is very much the same. And slowly, slowly, right, as we explore this, we'll come to that understanding ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it's easy to kind of roll these words, renunciation, bodhicitta, correct view, off the tip of our tongue, but it's important to really understand their import. So one way that we can think about renunciation or definite emergence is of a mind that is definitely striving towards liberation. So when we say definitely striving towards liberation or certainly striving towards liberation, that certainty that definitiveness is not something that is easy, right? So we have to bring forth this mind in stages. Mm-hmm. Another really important thing to understand is that if we don't have this mind of definite emergence, wishing to strive towards freedom from suffering to our for ourselves, then that compassionate wish to free other beings from suffering, it becomes almost laughable if we don't have that conviction of renunciation. Uh, So it's said that if a flame or a very hot object touches the surface of your skin, even just lightly, that is something that is very unbearable. That feeling of unbearableness, is it unbearability or unbearableness? <laughs> Tell me in the chat. That feeling of unbearableness is the feeling that we should have about samsara. That's renunciation. So, so if we're able to understand the faults of samsara and think that if I don't get free from samsara, that's definitely not acceptable. I definitely need to get out. Once we develop that conviction for ourselves, it is much easier to develop that wish for others. Mm-hmm. So Lama Tsongkhapa explains that we should look at the faults of samsara from two perspectives, from the, the, the problems, the difficulties that samsara is pre- presenting us uh, in this current lifetime, and from the perspective of the possible problems that it could bring to us in future lifetimes. And also to remember that a definite emergence or renunciation for the 
um, lower or unfortunate realms of samsara, thinking that, for example, I must be born in the deva, in the divine or uh, god realms, that this is not a perfect renunciation, right? That's a very limited renunciation. There's that story in the scriptures about the two nephews of Venerable Ananda that Geshe-la is recalling, and um, they had had some success in their meditations, so they had some faculties of clairvoyance, and they were able to perceive the happiness of those beings in uh, the deva realms, in the godlike realms of the form and formless realms, and so they were thinking, actually, like it would be pretty good to aspire to a rebirth in one of those places. So, through their meditation, they had been able to develop a taste of definite emergence of renunciation for like their current uh, human realm and the kind of wonders of samsara there. But they um, were not able to develop a renunciation for what they saw in uh, those devas, in those godlike realms, right? So it wasn't like a complete definite emergence. And in order to come to that kind of realization of that kind of complete definite emergence, uh, they had to do a lot of uh, more work in their cultivation. So it's really important that as we look at developing our definite emergence, that that def definite emergence or renunciation is for all of samsara, not just one particular abode within samsara. In the human realm, developing this definite emergence is something that should be a little bit easier because we can we can see right clearly ourselves that no matter how respected or famous a person is no matter how wealthy a person is because that respect and wealth is some sarak respect and wealth it is connected with karma and affliction and because it is connected with karma and affliction it is not a stable source of happiness we see this play out in the lives of many successful and famous people but we can think perhaps of our best experiences of samsaric happiness, think about those pleasant feelings that arose with the awareness of there is a happiness beyond that. There is a happiness and bliss that is stable and lasting. That is the bliss of liberation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Geshe said, of course, this isn't a full description of that bliss of liberation, but because the bliss of liberation is something that we have not yet tasted or experienced, but it's a goal that we want to get to. We want to bring sort of some idea for what it's like in our mind. And so once we bring forth this definite emergence or renunciation in the beginning part of the text, then bringing forth that love, compassion, and bodhicitta will become much more doable. See, because in the three principal aspects of the path, it is understood to be the final view of emptiness, which is ultimately able to uproot all of the obstacles and afflictions. When you look at the composition of the texts, 
of the text, I'm sorry, you'll see that the majority of it, the large balance of it is actually speaking about wisdom realizing emptiness. <laughs> However, today we'll be focusing on the second part of the text. We did, <laughs> people might not remember, but we actually did the first part of this teaching kind of well before the holiday. Um, so, um, but uh, today we'll be focusing on bodhicitta. So we understand the context that this definite emergence is the door to the path to liberation and that this uh, practice of bodhicitta is the door to the Mahayana path. So um, also when we speak about that liberation, there can be liberation from different things. But we understand in the context of this text, it's a complete liberation from all of samsara. So it is said that bodhicitta is like the door which allows us to enter the Mahayana path and the practice of uh, jampa yin and ningji yin. Ningji jampa. Ah, sorry. Uh, the practice of great compassion is what allows us to activate the Mahayana lineage, the the jik, yeah, the Mahayana lineage. Oh, that tombo shuloka tombo te tani shonju ji se shi givi jese de shi de jiang yao des. And so, when we look at the text, actually, um, we're looking at uh, verse number six for those of you who have the text with you. Um, it's actually number six is giving us the reason that we need to arise bodhicitta. Yet, if renunciation is not embraced by the pure motivation of bodhicitta, it will not become a cause for the perfect bliss of unsurpassed awakening, so the wise should generate supreme bodhicitta. So it's understood that without the assisting factor of that bodhicitta motivation, then the renunciation or definite emergence that we develop, it can't become a cause for that bliss of unsurpassed awakening, which is complete enlightenment. Uh -huh. So um, the wise, it said the wise should gener generate supreme bodhicitta. So what makes one wise is being a bodhisattva, one who has brought forth that mind. So, another important thing to understand from the perspective of cause. A virtuous action not imbued with the mind of bodhicitta will not become a cause for Buddhahood. A virtuous action not done with a mind of definite emergence will not become a cause for liberation. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so Geshe Le was saying that in terms of these causes for liberation and enlightenment, the motivation is extremely important. There are some scriptures which mention certain exceptions to this. For example, through the power of images of the enlightened beings, through the power of stupas, and so forth. It is said because of the power of the basis of that holy object, without a particular intention or motivation, it can become a powerful cause. So, the holy beings, though, to go back to our original topic, the holy beings explain that when we begin a session of practice and we do not 
take a moment to develop this mind of renunciation of definite emergence, the cultivation, the practice session itself, can become a cause for samsara rather than liberation. Uh, yes, so that renunciation together with that pure motivation of bodhicitta, if those are not there, that session will not become a cause for perfect enlightenment. Mm-hmm. So, so then um, a question could come up. So a question could come up. Well, if one has brought forth very well this renunciation, this definite emergence, but one has not yet brought forth that motivation of bodhicitta, is it really the case that whatever activity one engages in will not become the cause for uh the state of Buddhahood. So that's a question. But if we look to the source of Lama Tsongkhapa's text here, we can see very clearly he states that even that mind of definite emergence, if there is not an aspect of bodhicitta, that particular virtuous activity will not become a cause for complete enlightenment. Mm-hmm. So then, uh, a question can come up which says, well, if the pure motivation of bodhicitta is not brought forth, it does not become a supreme cause for enlightenment. How kind of um, exactly are we to take this? So for example, if the practitioner is developing the seven-point cause and effect instruction, such as recollecting being, uh, having the awareness of beings as one mother, recollecting their kindness and so forth, but has not yet reached that mind of bodhicitta. Does the positive thing they do not become a cause for complete enlightenment? Mm-hmm. So it also goes to a more general question of if we haven't been able to bring forth a realization of bodhicitta in our mind, does that mean that the virtuous activities that we do can't become a cause for enlightenment? Like how kind of encompassing is this? Yes, definite emergence, renunciation, without any thought of bodhicitta will not become a cause for complete enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Similarly, if one has a firm feeling for definite emergence or renunciation, along with a uh, correct view of emptiness, without them being imbued by bodhicitta, it is said that similarly that cannot become a cause for complete enlightenment. Sorry, I I think Geshe left one question unanswered, which I don't know. Uh, but what if you don't have the bodhicitta yet? If you don't have the realization, but you've cultivated some aspects for it. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask him that. Okay, so, <laughs> I sorry, I just thought we should pin that down. So if one is striving towards bodhicitta, developing love, compassion, and so forth, 
even though the bodhicitta does not realize, that's enough to imbue it with the power of bodhicitta and it can become a cause for complete enlightenment. So if one wants to be able to bring forth this supreme bodhicitta, what is the mode through which we bring it forth? How do we do that? Verse number seven, beings are swept along by the powerful current of the four rivers, tightly bound by the chains of their karma, so difficult to undo, ensnared within the iron trap of their self-grasping, and enshrouded in the thick darkness of ignorance. So how must one think if one wants to bring forth and achieve this mind of bodhicitta? Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, uh, so powerful current, Geshe said, you see the first line of verse number seven, powerful current is explained differently by different commentators. And then we see four rivers, an example of four rivers is given. Uh, Oh, uh, So those four rivers, in many commentaries, can be understood as birth, disease, old age, and death. And there's also a way to, from the perspective of the view, take the first of the four rivers as the cause of the afflictions. But it's important to also understand why we say current of the four rivers. It's a current is like a continuum, right? So we know that these sufferings of birth, disease, old age, and death are not something that we're going to experience just in this lifetime. They are a current that will move as a continuum throughout all our future lifetimes. So if we think about that and we think about the import of these words like current and so forth in a really full way, this can definitely be an effective method for bringing forth, uh, forth a feeling of definite emergence. So we think there is this problem of samsara, but one can become free of samsara. One can become free from samsara, not only that, but if I uh, implement the methods, I myself can become free of samsara. <laughs> Lord Milarepa said, It is fear of death and consequences that drove me to isolation in mountain retreat. But now, having glimpsed emptiness, I fear nothing at all. Because once one has that realization, then one is able to choose how and where one is going in the future, which is an incredible thing. Mm-hmm. So what keeps us then within this uh, state of samsara, beyond the causes of karma? Well, we look, it's the iron trap of self-grasping. Self-grasping is partly what keeps us here. So we understand, right, that karma is a big part of what is keeping us within samsara. But karma is kind of like the the functioning of uh, kind of like the ministers or the uh, envoys, the representatives. The, the main thing, the root, the kind of boss in all of this, is that 
which really keeps us firmly within samsara and drives karma, which is that self-grasping ignorance. There's a pr- profound text called the Uttara Tantra Shastra, the sublime continuum. And it says that when one reaches the stage of an Arya Bodhisattva, a Bodhisattva who has realized emptiness, then the current of birth, disease, old age, and death is cut. That continuum of uncontrolled birth, old age, disease, and death is cut. And think about that, right? That's the unfolding of real happiness, isn't it? And so also the sort of driving message of the text that we can see is that we need both emptiness and bodhicitta, right? They are symbiotic. They help each other. If we think about the recent teachings of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he's made it clear that the very heart of the practice is developing emptiness and bodhicitta. And then the other practices are important, but they are branches, right? Mm-hmm. And enshrouded in the thick darkness of ignorance, if we think that this unknowingness, this ignorance of how things really are, is kind of like a thick fog or smoke. That's what prevents us from seeing things clearly. Mm-hmm. So partly to sort of motivate those students, those practitioners who are considered sharp faculty, His Holiness the Dalai Lama sometimes jokes that if you understand this emptiness as the root, then you can cultivate a uh, Emptiness, sorry, if you understand the ignorance as the root, you can cultivate emptiness as a universal antidote to all of the afflictions, and you don't need to cultivate the individual antidotes. So the other thing to understand is that this ignorance grasping at the self is pervasive. And flavors all of our experiences, including what comes through the various sense consciousness of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body consciousness, and so forth. So if, similarly, if we are able to address this root of ignorance, all of the other afflictions that arise due to contact with these various sense doors, these will be dissipated. And so one of the main things, therefore, we need to understand, one of the main things, perhaps the main thing that one needs to strive to understand is this emptiness, right, informed by the view of dependent arising. (laughs) We talked about the mind's brightness, its characteristic of pure luminosity, but the reason that we're not able to use that is because of this thick fog or shroud of ignorance that obscures us. Mm-hmm. So, so it's almost like you have this beautiful, very bright light, but it's covered in a cloth, and so you can't enjoy illuminating your room and being able to see things. So that very powerful light, if you put a cup or a cloth or something on top of it, even though it's there, it doesn't bring you benefit. But once that obscuring object is removed, 
you'll be able to see everything. So similarly, once ignorance is removed, that luminosity of the mind will allow us to see all. And this wisdom is able to penetrate all objects. Just like that powerful lamp, when the cloth is removed, is able to illuminate everything in the room. It's not like it illuminates some things and doesn't illuminate others. So to be more precise, it is said in the scriptures that if one is able to have a realization of emptiness of one object, then although it might not simultaneously happen that one cognizes the emptiness of all objects, cognizing other phenomena or objects' emptiness will become very easy, very natural. So we can see also the methodology here, right, that um, when we realize emptiness, we can develop our understanding of emptiness using one object, and then once we're able to understand that ob the emptiness of that object, this can be carried over to many other all phenomena. Oh, yeah, did you it? This one? This one. Oh, So verse number eight. Again and yet again, they are reborn in limit, limitless samsara and constantly tormented by the three forms of suffering. This is the current condition of all your mothers from previous lives. Contemplate their plight, plight, and generate supreme bodhicitta. <laughs> And so, um, once again, uh, an exhortation to develop that supreme bodhicitta. So how do we arise bodhicitta? There are different uh, sort of methods. The two most well-known are the seven-point cause and effect instruction, as well as equalizing and exchanging self and others. But whichever presentation one looks at, one should understand that from the causal point of view, the most profound, powerful cause of bodhicitta is great compassion. So, so we can see actually Lama Tsongkhapa sort of touches on this by giving us a powerful image to bring forth compassion. And this is where all of the other training also falls into place. For example, we talked talked about trying to develop that awareness that you look at any sentient being and you can see them as equally kind to your mother, your father, whoever benefited you the most in this life. And all of those beings that are close to us that have shown us that great kindness, they are bound to this constantly turning wheel of samsara through which they are afflicted with the three types of suffering. The suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and the compounded or all-pervasive suffering. Oh, so Geshe said that normally we talk about, <coughs> excuse me, contemplating the, the three sufferings of all sentient beings. But there's an exception here. Arya bodhisattvas are technically considered sentient beings, but they are not really beset 
by all of these types of suffering. So you shouldn't think of Arya Bodhisattvas as part of this conglomeration of sentient beings in this context. That's because they are not beset by these three types of suffering. So to contemplate Arya Bodhisattvas in the context of this verse would be inappropriate. And of course, within those three types of suffering, of suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and all pervasive or compounded suffering, it's the all pervasive or compounded suffering which is the most pernicious and the most important to pay attention to. And really when we want to bring forth this cause of bodhicitta, which is great compassion, to be able to really bring it forth fully, right, an awareness and a contemplation of all of these sufferings within samsara is very important. Mm-hmm. So it is said that we want to be able to bring forth bodhicitta. We mentioned that the most important cause to have in place for this is great compassion. And we also mentioned that um, that great compassion necessarily involves a deep contemplation of the three types of uh, suffering of sentient beings. But is that deep uh, cultivation, a uh, contemplation of the three types of suffering beings enough in and of itself to bring forth great compassion? No. Could we just spend our entire, all of our meditation sessions just thinking about the suffering of sentient beings again and again and have this great compassion arise as a consequence of that? No, we could not. Mm-hmm. So, along with that deep contemplation of these three types of suffering of sentient beings, if we want that to become a cause for the arising of great compassion, we need the helping hand of another mind, another awareness, Yung Jampa. So, Yung Jampa is translated sometimes as the mind that sees all beings as attractive, as the mind that sees all beings as a beautiful, I, I I would almost translate it as an appreciation for all beings. Mm-hmm. So when we're meditating on love and compassion, if this is a big part of our practice and then we go out in the world and we see a sentient being that's experiencing a terrible suffering, it can be quite easy to develop a feeling of compassion in that instance. Uh, and, and some people, some people are able to kind of just extend that experience to wanting uh, a freedom from suffering for more and more beings. Mm-hmm. But if one hasn't trained in this contemplation of beings as beautiful, as attractive, this yongi jampa, what is missing? Without that comprehension, that appreciation of all sentient beings, just with that compassion, you won't get to the superior intention that thinks I myself alone must work to free the speech. Mm-hmm. And also understand that the supreme superior intention here is not the full expression of the superior intention that comes in the seven steps, but it is a superior intention which is necessary as an assisting factor for cultivating great compassion. Mm-hmm. But a feeling that wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be wonderful if beings were free from suffering and the causes of suffering? That's not even a uniquely bodhisattva or a Mahayana thought, is it? Because we know that the hearers, the shravakas, and the solitary realizers, the pratyeka buddhas, on the path of individual liberation, 
also have that wish. Uh, so merely thinking, wouldn't it be nice? How wonderful it would be if beings were free from suffering and the causes of suffering. That is actually not going to be enough to bring forth this realization, this Mahayana realization of great compassion. Mm-hmm. So, what we need to think is how wonderful it would be if sentient beings were free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I myself want to help them to be free of those causes. That kind of flavor of a superior intention takes it far enough that one can bring forth great compassion. Mm-hmm. So this, what I translate as appreciation of all sentient beings, where the mind that sees sentient beings as beautiful, as attractive, as appealing, a portion of that is necessary to be able to really bring forth this great compassion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we see those beings who we have regard for, who we see as attractive. It's easier to develop compassion for them. Think about your family members or your partner or the person who is closest to you. When they experience some kind of difficulty or suffering, it's almost unbearable for us. We think, I really have to do something to be able to help them to get rid of that problem. This can kind of show you how it works. Yeah, yeah. But think about it. Think about the people that you pass every day who you don't know strangers who you see experiencing various forms of suffering. Look at what happens in your mind. You might have this feeling, wouldn't it be nice if they didn't have to suffer like that? But very rarely do we have the feeling that I have to do something about the suffering of that person I don't know. So really, to develop this great compassion, we want to have this regard for sentient beings, seeing them as attractive, seeing them as beautiful, along with that deep comprehension of their suffering. Both. Another thing that we want to do to be able to progress with this realization is to understand that at the moment, I have this temporary veil of ignorance and I can only see relationships of this life. But any of these beings that is suffering that I look to, it is absolutely possible that they showed me kindness, that they helped me, and that they had helped me many, many, many times, actually. So when we look at that that we call the I or the self, it is said that it is designated dependently upon the coming together of six elements. So it's earth, fire, air, water, space, plus consciousness. So in that way, we see that the self and consciousness are like a continuum. Namshi Mm-hmm. If we look at a flower or a bush or something like that, 
it is designated on the coming together of particle and elements based upon the earth, fire, air, water, and so forth, but it does not possess consciousness. So we ourselves, we have that I or that self that is designated in basis of dependence on consciousness. That consciousness and its attendant self-awareness is a continuum that is present from the first moment of conception where we become present, where we uh, take residence in our mother's womb. Is it possible that that consciousness and that self-awareness just appears randomly in the womb of your specific mother without any causes or conditions? No, it is not. It has to arise from a previous similar cause from a previous similar instance. So, if you explore this line of reasoning, what you'll see is that to come to some sense about it, you have to start thinking about previous instances of that consciousness, which means previous lifetimes. And if you are open to that positing of previous lifetimes, then you're open to a mother and father that gave birth to you in those previous lifetimes, as well as siblings, helpers, other people that somehow benefited you. <laughs> we see that also like with every being from human down to animals to even the tiniest insects, right? They have the parents, the mother and father, and all of those relationships. Mm-hmm. So, if we are able to kind of develop this vast sort of awareness and comprehend those potential relationships with every last sentient being, and to think that every one of those beings may have at one time helped us or benefit us, benefited us, developing this yidu ongwa, this mind of regard for them, this feeling that they are attractive and special, will come naturally. So you can see here, Geshe-la's approach is to tell various lines of reasoning that can open up the possibility for past and future lifetimes in our minds. He's not saying, Buddha said in the scriptures, so you must accept, right? That's not his style. We want to explore this through reasoning. And in fact, it's not really a scriptural consideration at all because it is merely explaining how things are. Mm-hmm. And in fact, because of this flawless logical reasoning to open up these possibilities, it is said that this is why Lama Tsongkhapa saw the Pramanavartaka the Treatise on Valid Cognition, as one of the most important texts, because it talks about all this. Pramanavartika does not cite scripture, but instead, through positing reasons alone, establishes its arguments. Yeah. あれ。で、とそんじとべじにぱいたにんでわよさで。ちょよまです。あ、sorry. His estimation of this text of the Pramnavartaka. They said because Dharmakirti and other important figures in these texts on valid cognition were holding non Prasangaka views, were holding views of lower schools of tenets, how could a scripture composed by beings who had not yet reached the highest philosophical view become a cause for Buddhahood? 
for that wisdom. Uh, but actually, this Pramana Vartika, the reason is because the style of reasoning in this Pramana Vartika opens the mind to positing the reasons behind renunciation, behind emptiness, behind love and compassion, using logic. So Geshe said we didn't cover much today really, we only covered three shlokas or verses, but he hopes he was able to give you at least a taste of some of the essential things for our Dharma practice. Gonda, lama tsum kapa nyodri shegen in zolen karete sum. <laughs> so I asked Geshe how Lama Tsongkhapa answered his critics when he was praising this Pramanavartika text. And Geshe said it was very easy. It is said that all of the realizations can be unlocked through that power of reasoning. So if we're able to develop our reasoning, right, that's what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even if some of the people who composed these texts were not necessarily holding these views, even of all beings being attractive and necessarily reaching Buddhahood for their sake, the way of reasoning and the impeccable mode for arising that reasoning that they propose can be used to bring forth those realizations. Yeah. So we always talk about faith based upon reason, right? We want to be modern, reasoned Buddhists. So anything that helps us to develop discerning, clarity, and logical reasoning is greatly beneficial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing that's really important is we talk about the benefits that we get as the practitioner of love, great compassion, and bodhicitta. How do these benefits unlock for us? Because as we contemplate love, compassion, and go towards bodhicitta, we develop this mind that thinks all these beings are experiencing suffering and they need happiness. And then we think, I myself will help them to move beyond suffering and reach happiness. That Supreme intention is something that is infinitely powerful. With that brave superior intention, because of its undeniable power, the small things, the fears that we experienced before in samsara, they will no longer be able to frighten us because of that determination. With that fearless attitude, with bringing forth this mind of the courageous warrior, how could all of those tiny things which normally fear and worry us possibly cause us any problem? So when we think about it from this perspective, when we bring forth that mind of compassion, it empowers our consciousness to become something vast, powerful, and encompassing. And so many difficulties are cleared away. Mm-hmm. We see the example with so many holy beings and even our precious teachers because they brought forth this awareness and this wish. Even when they experience sometimes seemingly terrible obstacles of illness and so forth, the mind remained completely happy and undisturbed. So, to close, to quote one last advice from Lama Tsongkhapa, 
It is through naturally one who strives towards the welfare of others. Their welfare is naturally achieved. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we shall end the session here. So, so Geshe said, apologies, we didn't get to 400 verses. We are still trying to do a little bit of 400 verses, but we will do some next time. Uh. <laughs> Through the merits that myself and others have accumulated, uh, then uh, through the power of these merits, may they be able to bring forth the wishes to benefit others and actualize it. Okay, more neo join the world's car in a top of it. Oh, cause it didn't you wish you didn't talk. And may these merits become the cause for all of the wars, conflicts, diseases, environmental disasters, and imbalances in the elements to be completely cleared away. Through these merits, may all six types of beings within samsara be able to achieve perfect mental health, perfect physical health, without any suffering. So we'll pause there. <laughs> so questions <laughs> sorry guys just like tell them they can ask questions don't be like a stone sitting there yes <laughs> I was, he asked if I was meditating yeah that's, <laughs> let's go with that um, any questions go ahead Annie uh, um, uh, could Geshe-la clarify um, consciousness does he mean Nampra Shepa and how does the the mind sem fit in does it mean that only the consciousness travels from lifetime to lifetime but not the mind okay yeah uh then non so the uh nomadi non so the nezo truth then so then uh namkar shepa chigyore roa then non so the namkar shepa da namba shepa ah namba shepa namba shepa sorry yeah uh, did did, I, did you say nampa or namkar I think I got it wrong, so my apologies. <laughs> it's it's Nampa Shepa, so that's probably Kedrup. <laughs> so um Nampa Shepa Dang Sem Ni Dinso uh Dinso Yewa Chela then it uh Kewa ne Kewa Droya. Sorry, can you phrase the question again, Annie? I s now I confused myself. Oh yes. Um is it consciousness as in the, the five factors, the Nampa Shepa yeah. that travels from lifetime to lifetime and then what does the the mind do sam is that 
right, right. Okay. Does, yeah, or does that yeah. whole thing travel or only part of it? Got it, got it. Sorry okay. about that. Yes, yes, okay. I got you. Uh, then it nampa shepa seria di di kewa ne kewa droge ni na. Then it ah then so the nampa shepa di nitsu ngadang jawa chikures kewa ne kewa droge ni ko ni na. Then it sem seria di kandis chagures ko kewa ne kewa yang droge ni nampa shepa chikbare des. Yes. Chikbo. Sorry. Oh, uh, sem do no shi zala ba yena yena chena. Yeah. yeah, so this is a complex um, question, and in terms of how mind relates to the Nampa Shepa, to consciousness, we know that um, in discussions of the mind, right, we have these two categories of mind and mental factors, right? No, no, she Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Right. So Geshe said to use an easy um analogy, um yeah, he's using Canadian government because he had to learn that. So that but you know, <laughs> apply it wherever it's practical. So if we uh think about you have the prime minister, right? And he or she is the actual representative of the government. And then underneath them, they have various ministers of health, defense, foreign affairs, and so on. So this nampa shepa, right, consciousness in that sense, that is like the prime minister. And then if we think about mind or minds, that's the minister functioning underneath it. Yeah, which in, in this case we would say are mental factors. So in this analogy, actually, Geshla said, if we think about the prime minister and the various ministers underneath him or him, Nampa Shepa, consciousness and mind, would both be referring to the prime minister. And all of those ministers underneath them would be considered the mental factors. So, uh, 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 because we understand that whether we call it Nampa Shepa, consciousness or mind, that prime minister would not be able to form the government perform the functions of government without the ministers underneath like the minister of health and so forth so we could say that these are feelings discriminations and so forth those other mental factors and when we look at those mental factors of a, a feeling discrimination and so forth we see that all of those are determined by their function, just as a minister in the government is determined by their portfolio, by their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So the prime minister, he or she is in that role, we can think of them as being like the mind or consciousness. Go on the younger By how they are apprehended. By how they are apprehended as an object, not by a specific function. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So, in terms of the next part of the question, what is going from this lifetime to the next lifetime? Sing zin dang kalun niga, sem dang sem jun niga. Is the prime minister together with their ministers? Is the mind mm. together with its mental factors? Uh, with its mental factors. So the sem and the sem chung, the nampa shepa and the sem chung. Se do nampa shepa deji des me manamado. So mind. And consciousness in this sense of nampa shepa. I don't know how you translate um, nampa shepa, Annie. How would you translate that? Uh, I, I had heard of it as consciousness. 
Stop That's why I was wondering because it's well. kind of vague. I mean, yeah, it's very yeah. vague. In English, yeah. it's very vague. But Geshe said, in the context that we're talking about here, mind and consciousness, sem dang nampa shepa are of mm -hmm. one meaning. Sem, <clears throat> okay, okay. Nampa shepa sem me mandal tenda chipa des. So, mind, um, yip. Yeah, so, so there's an honorific for mind and a normal mm -hmm. word for mind. So both mm -hmm. of those together with consciousness in this context are of one meaning. Uh, yeah, and then um, when we talk about the nampa shepa, right, we can divide that further into uh, six. Uh, Eye consciousness, nose consciousness, <laughs> tongue consciousness, ear consciousness, body consciousness, mental consciousness. I hope I got all those. Yeah. So all of those dissolve into the ground of the primary mental consciousness at the time of death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and just to also understand, right, that we haven't even talked about all of the mental factors here. Mm -hmm. In fact, they are mm -hmm. few in number. There's it's quite the, a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. No <laughs> wonder, no oh, wonder Gekhila is a perfect new Canadian residence. He understands the government so well. I mean, Canada's also PR on Canada Gijong Ship Trach and Hako Gires. Yeah, so Geshla said actually the government example can be can be carried over to any style of government. So you think about the prime minister and their ministers, you can think about the the, the king President. and his various ministers or envoys just like that. <laughs> so thanks so much. Yeah, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, sure. So first one is, um, is there a beginner's guide to the Praman of Artika? Nansu, the Tsema Namje Le Tam Boa Gi Ngunjo Ngocho Dabo Chikyore Desa. Le Tam Boa Gi. Yeah, Le Tam Boa Gi Ngocho Lori Desa. Was Noji. Lori Digan Dote Tanda Ngan Dote Shite Desa Mas. So Geshe said it would be the Lori mind and mental factors. And actually, we just related to Annie's question, we touched on some of those actually. So that would be the introduction. Yeah. Ngan Dote Poke Peja Tari Dira Chunga, Dira Ndi. Yeah. So, so Geshe said at the monastery, right, the first stages of study are divided into what they call collected topics or dura. And so there's a small, middling and extensive collected topics. And the first step of understanding these collected topics are thinking about various shapes, various colors, distinguishing them and how they relate together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Lorik um, uh, would be kind of the uh, introductory text. Now, there, there's a lot of different um, uh, books about Lorik in English, mind and awareness, as well as Sem Dang Sem Chung, mind and mental factors. But what also helps us to activate our reasoning in conjunction with the Lorik is the Tarik the signs and reasonings. That's also very useful. So, Tarig, the signs and reasonings, helps us to think in an expansive way when someone poses us a question, we can think of many ways to answer it. And similarly, when we pose a question to somebody, we can think of many ways or angles with which to pose the question. It helps one be expansive. Yeah. And so that's why many scientists, for example, they appreciate these uh, genres of uh, Buddhist literature. <laughs> so hopefully, um, I, I mean, there's a lot of um, books about uh, Lorig and Semdang Semchung. The FPMT has a really great uh, module on mind and mental factors. I think you can even get that for free through Amitabha Buddhist Center. So just an English suggestion uh, for Pedro. Do, do. And, and um, related to the Pramanavartika, to the Treatise on Valid Cognition and its Composition, there is a story 
that Geshe-la will share with you next time. So we have to come so back so next time. Mm-hmm. 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 It is said that when this text was composed, it was composed by a great pandita known as Dharma Kirti. composed, it was composed by a great pandita known as Dharma Kirti. Uh, he was Solang uh, Chungwapa. He was uh, a bodhisattva on the small stage of accumulation. So very early in the bodhisattva path when he was writing this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He met a very terribly uh, sinful person, just a really, really bad person. And he sort of thought, maybe I'm just going to give up on bodhisattva. There's no way I can save this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I said to Gesha, maybe we just tell them the story. So the story is the slate upon which he was composing this text, right? He threw this up in the air and said, when this falls, I give up on Bodhicitta. But Manjushi sort of intervened and didn't allow that slate to fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, Manjushri said to him, don't be discouraged. You don't need to give up on your bodhicitta, even if you are not able to help this particular sentient being right now on the basis of what you accomplish. You will be able to help so many sentient beings in the future. You will, oh sorry, the last part, you will be like a son in the world and further Manjushri promised that whoever puts effort into studying and comprehending your texts will directly receive my help. <laughs> So I hope that question was answered. Next one. Yes. Uh, oh, I lost it. It moved on. Here we go. Yeah. Um, please help me understand non-attachment. Not sure how th- this is possible in the lifetime of a mother, or am I misunderstanding non-attachment? Nanso dechak mepa di chi gogire duas inetse di amayena. Dochak mepagi drotang yomares. Kochi ko norgires, dochak mepa kandes chik sabotang gires. Kandes kandes. So so la sevio pajola. Ah, pajola. Dochak roa. Dochak mepa so go gire. Do as in a yamama. Mare mare de mi paropo de so. So, Gesh is not sure. Is she talking about the perspective of the mother because, like, I guess she'd be thinking about attachment to the children? Is that how we're to understand it? I, 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 would, I would guess so, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing that Geshe would say when we talk about non-attachment or abandoning attachment, with a sophisticated understanding of the path, we actually understand that attachment isn't negative in all situations and circumstances. In some ways, it can become an assisting factor. So, for example, Arya Bodhisattvas, many of the Arya Bodhisattvas are said to not yet have abandoned uh, attachment. But because of the other realizations that they have had on the path, the residues of attachment in their mind stream actually act as an assisting factor, compelling them to work for the welfare of others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But as a beginner, what do we need to do about our attachment? We need to see how our attachment taints the way that we perceive things, how they appear to us, and to understand the attachment which is leading to those mistaken appearances and unravel those. Yeah, yeah. So in the case of a mother, for example, there's that natural kind of parental concern, right? which we could say is an attachment. You want your child to study and to do well and to have a decent life. But where that attachment becomes a problem is it's so strong that you're willing to undermine the welfare of other children to make sure that your child always gets the best. 
And then it becomes a problem. Uh-huh. Yes. But actually, in, in the relationships between parents and children, that measure of attachment just to the point that we want the child to do well and to be like an ethical and successful person, we could see that almost as a facet of parental responsibility. Also, there's a misunderstanding about the Buddha, right? People often say that the Buddha abandoned his family. He left behind his wife and young child and then went off into the forest. And that's like how non-attachment is understood. But what they don't tell you is that it was because of understanding that going to the forest and achieving that wisdom and liberation. What was the one of the first things he did? He returned to his family and also helped to lead them to the state of liberation. And so actually one of the benefits of our spiritual practice is that as we kind of progress, we are able to have a positive impact upon our family and those other people close to us and lead them towards paths to what is more positive or wholesome. <laughs> so hopefully that answered that. That question was on Facebook, so maybe Gesha won't get a confirmation. Any other questions, Dave? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Reno. Oh, thank you. Uh... I want to ask, uh, in my analyze the car, uh, I cannot find the inherent existence of the car. Uh, but, so the car is said to be empty, but the empty. Sorry, sir, of the sir, car... you're, you're, you're extremely muffled. It's, it's, um, you're oh. extremely muffled. Uh, if you could maybe put your mouth closer to the oh. microphone, it's almost uh, like there's yeah. a blanket between you. Uh, uh, now, if my it's voice better is now. Good. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I want to ask uh, when I am when I am uh, analyzing the car, I cannot find the inherent existence of the car. So, right. but the so the car is said to be empty, but the emptiness of the car uh, is also dependent uh, of the car in the first place, right? So, the the, uh, I cannot I cannot know the emptiness of the car if uh, if there is no car in the first place. So does it mean that the emptiness of the car is also empty or, or it's also uh, dependent on the so uh, also does it mean that the ultimate truth of emptiness is also dependent on conventional truth or the empirical truth? Is that true? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good question. There's really, there's really three questions there. So I just want to break them down for you to make sure that I translate the question uh, to uh, Geshe-la directly. So you're talking about the emptiness of the car, that if you break the car or uh, the chariot, right, down to its parts, that allows you to understand that it is empty of inherent existence. But this realization of the emptiness of the car would not have been possible if there was not the starting point of the car in the first place to break it down and posit its emptiness. So then as a consequence of that, is the ultimate truth of emptiness that we realize dependent upon conventional or relative truths such as the car. Is that your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, great. Okay, yes, just wanted to make sure. Um ko nanso perna mota dabochi shinta nanchana pengone shinta daboyena roa nanso di ang gaksha di rangjingi drupa di samlotane mepa so gogire dua deni nanso chashe chatsangwa yewa chene chashi yewa che chashi yewa che chashi yewa che deni shinta Zugazusa mepa dabo chagires, then a de la tene nanso shinta seria di rangjingi drupa mares hakogi chigdua. In a di yapo hakoela nanso tambo shinta chik yogores, shinta chik tongores. Di dabo chik samlo tanga, then a nanso dundam demba koela, 
nanso um kunzop dempa tambochik gogiribes dundang dempa kunzop dempa latene togiribes chuadire yes so gashila said a very precise question yes yes yeah it's like that, but there's two possible approaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in the Umalajupa, in the Majimakavatara treaties, it says that the uh, mind, younger yeah. yeah. The mind that penetrates conventional or relative truth, the top. Uh-huh. So the mind that penetrates relative truths is the ground that gives rise to the mind that is able to penetrate. Ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. So, so from this perspective here, what the Majimakavatara is saying is that we develop our mind, right? First by penetrating those relative truths, and then we can penetrate ultimate truth. Okay. So it's in fact the mind that penetrates relative truths. This is like the stairway on the ground floor which leads us to the second floor where the mind can com- comprehend um, ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. And so ultimate truth, the second floor of that house, if we're precise about this, we understand that here we're talking about the wisdom realizing emptiness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's an exception. There's a paradox here, which is the most extremely hidden phenomena, subtle aspect of relative truths. These can only be comprehended by a mind that has been empowered by a previous realization of ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. See, to unpack this, we would have to say that it's the coarse relative truth penetrating mind, which is the foundation for the mind that is penetrating ultimate truth. And subsequently, that mind that is penetrating ultimate truth becomes the foundation for the mind penetrating the most extremely hidden aspect of relative truths. Yeah. So that's how it unfolds in stages. So, so Geshe's first attempt to answer your question uh, w- w- would be that. Did that give you a little bit of clarity? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. And so, but the ultimate truth in uh, Lama Songkhapa view is not the absolute, uh, it's not independent truth, but uh, it's also empty, uh, uh, it's also dependent. Not, that was not, the last uh, part of your question, I forgot. Yes, is that ultimate truth also empty? Then, uh, Absolutely, that's correct. In the sutras, in fact, it speaks about the emptiness of emptiness, and that's what it's pointing at. Mm-hmm. The other thing to understand about this presentation, too, is that um, this awareness of dependent arising is the assisting factor which helps us to bring forth this meditation on emptiness. But when we go from the analytical to the placement meditation on emptiness, you are no longer having that uh, dependent arising 
in the picture. You set that aside and just penetrate single pointedly emptiness. For the um, placement meditation in Lama Tsongkhapa's presentation, he um, puts a lot of emphasis on the sky like emptiness which dawns in the mind after one has determined that there is no pinpointable stable existence at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the interesting thing too is as we meditate upon emptiness and for example we're, we're able to have a cognition of maybe those flowers or another object as being empty of inherent existence before that becomes kind of firm that ignorance is always kind of almost like operating to, to, to try to bring back some measure of inherent existence. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like um, if you have um, a piece of food, in, in, in particular if you have a piece of like old meat and you get rid of that old meat from your house, but there's still kind of that smell of the old meat to which the flies are returning. So as long as there is that kind of trace there, the misconception can re-arise. So the ignorance is kind of always looking like the flies for that opportunity to build even on that kind of last vestige of that appearance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So His Holiness, a kind of, a, sorry, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa proposes that once we have gone through that process that there is nothing findable at all and that vast sky-like emptiness arises within the mind, going to the Semla Sharni, didn't it? After that sky like emptiness has arisen in the mind, no matter how much we look at dependent arising, there is never that danger of uh, us somehow falling that the dependent arising is somehow maybe possibly leading to a stable existence. That ignorance cannot come back. Uh, yeah, so we can use different examples of like external objects. Like a, a, like a restaurant or a nice place or things like that. Yeah, so I think we'll leave it there. Yeah. Ho- Hopefully that um, went to that last part of the question. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Geshula said that this sky like emptiness dawning in the mind where there is this feeling that there is nothing pinpointable whatsoever at all, and the importance, the emphasis placed on that by Lama Tsongkhapa. That is a sort of source of contention with other schools. Some followers of the Sakya, Kaju, and Nyingma in particular are not agreeing with that approach. Oh, it's totally yeah. 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 So, so Geshe said it's good, right, to understand these different approaches and 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 where they disagree, actually. Yeah. So we will come to a discussion of that later. Uh, so the other thing to understand too is that when Geshe is explaining these various approaches to you, it's to benefit. It's never saying this approach is better than that approach. That's not the tack that Geshe takes with these matters. Rather, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he sees each of them as like a different colored flower in a meadow and they all make the meadow beautiful in their own way. Yeah. So, so we should see all of these um, uh, philosoph- 
philosophical schools, all of these sort of sects as these beautiful flowers in the field. Uh, but of course, also among the followers of those uh, various uh, schools, there are some who are maybe not ethical, but that, of course, does not take away from the color of the flowers. It just means that uh, the, the particular follower is unethical. Okay, chew it, chew it. <laughs> so I, th I see one more hand. I think we'll take one more question before we go. Go ahead. I, I can't see the name, but I can see the hand. Yeah, go ahead, B. Um, I'm glad you mentioned about the other school, how they talk about uh, ultimate truth. I'm just going to ask one part of my question here since you're going to elaborate more on it next week. Sure. The mind that is directly realizing emptiness has only the non-affirmative negation of emptiness appear, which means nothing appear. However, dormant within that mind, is there also naturally the quality of compassion and bodhicitta? Okay, yeah, I, I think I got your question. Nanso Nosu Tope Tompani Nosu Topegi Sem D Rua Megak Megak Latene Dabochik Yongware Duas Ane um Nanso Megak Latene Tongi Nosu Topegi Sem D Dang Nyamdu Rua Kiecho ninge gi kiecho ninge simpe dago gi nezo chik yurebes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is a very good question. Also, thank you for saying Megak I, uh, the, as the non affirming negation. Geshe actually wanted to mention that, and I was like, the, the English word was not coming, so I appreciate that. But <laughs> yeah, he, said, he, said, he said when he mentioned Megak, I was like, I can't get my head around that very. Somehow the word was not coming into my mind. So, thank you for saying non affirming negation. It's very appreciated. Um, so, um, basically, what Geshe is saying is that. At this moment, when there is the mind directly realizing emptiness, it is infused with compassion, right? Sinpe. The, the Tibetan word is sinpe. It's like infused, or you could almost think like flavored by. There is a trace of compassion. And the Loseling. But the different Gelugpa institutions, <laughs> actually, the details of this they give differently. So in Drepung Luzeling Monastery, for example, <laughs> as well as Ganden Shartse Monastery, they are holding that there is the infused in, there may be kind of like a trace of that compassion during that direct realization of emptiness. But because the Arya Bodhisattva is in single pointed meditation, <inaudible> med meditative equipoise on emptiness, semla <inaudible> yomaris, there can't actually be compassion in the mind. Right, it can't be like a notable presence. <inaudible> so, what Sera J would say, and I guess other monasteries that are kind of holding the same view as Sera J, would they they would say that it is infused by compassion. The mind has kind of like that trace or that flavor of compassion that is directly realizing emptiness. But the compassion can also still be present within the mind. It is just in the background. It is somewhat diminished because of the focus on emptiness, but it is still in the background. Mm -hmm. 
ตันตันเลกะเจวิกาละยายะกลุนนิกาลชอนจิเซชูชิมโบจิวาซิตามาระวาสเดนเนสิมเปตาติจีเนละยายะเลกะเจวิกาลชอนจิเซกซอซอช
Oye, de eso, DJ. <laughs> so Geshela is content to leave it here. Um, if, uh, <laughs> he, said, he says Dave's stretching. He's <laughs> 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 so tired. <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody. Um, and um, we will see you uh, next Sunday if you're free. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keshela. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy indeed. New Year. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much.